Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. I'm Jay Connor, your host and also known as the Private Money Authority. And if you are uh, tuning in for the first time to the show, I want to give you a special welcome. You may be tuning in from one of our YouTube channels or you may be on iTunes or Google Play. No matter where you're from, we're glad you're here. And if this is your first time, we talk about all things related to real estate investing. We talk about single family houses, commercial apartments, storage buildings, self storage, land, and everything you can think of. We talk about how to find deals, how to get your deals funded, how to sell quickly, how to automate your business. And if you've been tuning in over the last few months, you know that we have just amazing guests and experts that come here on the show. Today is no different. But before I introduce my special guest today, I've got a gift for everybody. You know, I'm known as the Private Money Authority and of what we talk about when it comes to funding your deals. In this world of real estate investing, we don't rely on mortgage companies or banks or hard money lenders. We get our funding when we pay all cash with private money from private lenders. When I was first started investing in real estate deals, over 16 years ago, my first six years, I relied on getting funding from the local banks. And then I was cut off like everybody else in 2009 with no notice. And I was introduced to this wonderful world of private money. Since that time, I've never missed out on a deal because I didn't have the money. And I've got a free on-demand masterclass on the internet that will reveal to you the five easy steps of having no funding for your deals to having hundreds of thousands of dollars ready to fund your deals. That masterclass is called where to get the money now. And I'm going to give you all the website right now that you can make a note of. In fact, we'll put it up. If you're watching on one of our video channels, we'll put it right up here on the video, uh, on the uh, video right now to where you can go check it out. It's at www.jayconner.com forward slash money podcast. That's J Connor, J A Y C O N N E R.com forward slash money podcast. Go check it out and you'll see very quickly how to get funding for your deals. Again, that's got nothing to do with your mortgage company, your banks or your hard money lenders. With that on with today's show, I'm so excited to have on the show with me, Josiah Rivera, who's from down in Florida. He's one of my ultra, ultra successful students that are he and his father are in my platinum group also in my high-end top level mastermind group and i've invited josiah to come on here to share his story with you all and with that josiah welcome to the show hey jay glad to be here man thank you so much for uh, joining me here on the show josiah i tell you you are an inspiration i mean my lands you're like you know, you're building your empire right now and and how old are you, 14? <laughs> I look 14. Yeah, puberty was hard on me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, how old are you, uh, Josiah? I'm 23. 23 years old. You started in this business how long ago? At the, just all together or real yeah, estate? All, all, yeah, when, when did you do your first deal? I guess technically my first deal was as a realtor, if you want to say deal, I guess, but transaction, I was 20. So, so I've, been, so I've been in it for a little bit. Gotcha. And you've been, in, you and your father, you all have been in my world now for what? Well, you came into the platinum program, what, about six months ago? I lose track of March. time. It was March. Yeah, so let's see here. So yeah, about, about six months ago you came in. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. you've got just an amazing story. You know, what we want to talk about here on the show is, well, first of all, you're not even old enough to be a millennial, are you? What are you? No, no I'm actually the last year. I'm, the, yeah, the, the last year of being a millennial is 1996. And that's when I was, uh, <laughs> so you actually are uh, barely a millennial. Barely, yeah. So anyway, barely. what I want to talk with you here on the show about is the advice that you can give other you know, young people that are in their like, you know, early twenties and, uh, well, let's just go ahead and start with that. Well, first of all, let's let everybody know a little bit about yourself. So uh, the deals that you've done so far, approximately 
How much profit and equity have, have you made so far since you started investing in real estate? So say, say just over the past year, year and a half. Okay. So I, I went full time last August. So August of 2018. So, so a little bit over a year ago. A little bit over a year ago. Uh, and as of uh, the end of November, we'll be approaching, we'll have a little bit over six figures. Nice. So, in, so profit and equity over six figures and like, just a little bit over a year. So with that being established, I mean, you know what you're, you know what you're doing, you're doing deals. What advice can you go ahead and give just right off the bat to, you know, people your age who are looking to get into real estate investing? I mean, the challenges that you had to overcome. I mean, what advice can you give people your age? Plan. So my biggest advice I think would be to plan and know what you want to do. What are your interests? especially if you're a young entrepreneur, you want to be doing something that you're really passionate about and then become totally obsessed with it and become an expert very quickly because that's how you're going to get over that age hurdle. When you're talking to a seller, say if you're in real estate, right? So if you're talking to a seller, they know whether or not you're an expert or not just by the way you speak, your, uh, you know, how you pull up, your demeanor and how much you know and are, are subconsciously aware and the problems that you can solve them. So the, the more you become an expert in your field, the better you're going to do. And that was probably one of the biggest aha moments as of like how to describe exactly what I was thinking. Last mastermind meeting was framing yourself as an educator and your framing is just so, so key, especially when there's an age issue, or at least you think there's an age issue when you're going in, because it, a lot of the times, you know, sellers are a lot older than, you know, they've had, uh, they've had houses for a little while, you know, it's a different ball game and you're coming in and you don't have that much money and, and it, you might be a little bit intimidated, but if you really know your stuff, you can really help people out and make an impact and, and they know that you're legit. So let's give that a little bit of color and flesh that out, Josiah. So you were just mentioning at our last mastermind meeting, one of your aha moments was taking a way to frame yourself as an educator. What does that mean? So it means that when you are either whether on the phone or in person, your body language, your tonality, everything has to just be subconscious confidence. Meaning when they look at you, they, you can just tell if someone's legit or not, or if they really know their stuff or if they're sharp. And being sharp is one of the, the most important things uh, when you're young, because they're like, wow, well, you know, who's this guy? He owns a, you know, he owns a company or whatever. He's like, you he must come from a rich family or something. And then you're like, oh no, no, I started it. Yeah, I started it. And then they're like, what? I'm sorry, where are you getting all this? So avoiding questions that may be a, a mental obstacle to getting the deal done. They don't even get asked when you're framing yourself as an educator and you're adding uh, information to people uh, first. So I try, to, I try to come up and be as confident as possible um, and really know my stuff and, and kind of think of myself as more of a consultant to point them in the right direction, whether that's doing business with me or not. What kind of deals uh, have you been doing or are you doing? I mean, there's all kinds of real estate deals. There's wholesale deals mm -hmm. where you, you, know, you, you, get, you get a property under contract, you assign that to another real estate investor to take it down. You know, you do, you, there's lease optioning, there's funding with private money, there's rehabbing, fixing and flipping. What kind of deals have y'all been doing? So we have been focusing on uh, wholesaling. So I actually hate construction, <laughs> so I don't like it. My strengths are in marketing and sales, so I try to stick to that. So I really have that business mind frame of get revenue in the door as fast as possible and move on to the next one. And I also just enjoy the actual deal, the hunt, right? The, the closing part. And once it's closed, that part's over, right? And then you're not paid yet if you're going to go in and actually flip it, right? So I, I feel like I'm like, oh gosh, well, I just set myself up, you know? So that's just a mental thing for me, but it's just not my business model. I like to get, keep things short term, get in, get out, get a check and move on unless I'm going to take it down for cash flow or if I'm going to take over the debt subject to and, and go that route. I've got a good friend that uh, does a lot of wholesale deals and I heard him recently say, he said, Jay, he says, people say they're in the wholesaling business. He says, the way I look at my business is I'm really not in the wholesaling business. I'm in the marketing business. You know, you, you mentioned that uh, you love marketing, you love sales. So tell everybody, what does your wholesaling business look like? In other words, 
what's your front end funnel look like on how you're locating deals and just take us through, give us a 30,000 foot view of step by step. What's your wholesaling business look like? Sure. So we do a ton of cold calling. That's how I got my first deal. And that's how I'm probably going to get my last deal, to be honest with you. You're saying cold calling, like you, you are calling up people that like, they have no idea who you are and you're just like, boom, calling them up. Yep, absolutely. So what we do is I still have not delegated the data creation yet, you know, or, or pulling lists and things like that from online sources. I think that's kind of a CEO's job, making sure that your business is in the right direction and providing really good data to your team so that they have the highest likelihood of, of closing deals. So I, I really like to be involved in the data process and making new lists and, and, and testing things out. So I take care of that end. And then once it's skip traced, which is essentially sending in a, a large list, a, a supplier online, like, you know, there's, there's a ton of them. Uh, if you just Google skip tracing, you have a, a, a thousand of them, you know, but they'll send you numbers if they have them. You send them a list of addresses uh, with names of the owners. Whenever uh, they have those numbers, they'll send them back to you and you just call them up. Who's your favorite skip tracing service right now? We use batch skip tracing. Yeah, batch, it, batch skip tracing. Mm -hmm. It's been the most affordable and the, and the most effective so far. Got you. Let's make sure our audience is up with us. So you're getting a list. Now, what's your favorite kind of list to get? What kind of, you know, what kind of potential sellers or, or list are you getting? So it just kind of depends. We've been testing out several different ones. I really like driving for dollars lists. And if anyone doesn't know what driving for dollars is, is when you or someone on your team actually will drive around neighborhoods and look for distressed properties, write down the address. You go and look them up and see in public record and see who owns the property and then make a big list like that. That's a great way to get started. It's very cost effective as well. I also really like probates and inheritance. Those are huge. My biggest deals have been from probates for sure. And I guess so you, so you get your list. So you've got driving for dollars, you're getting the physical addresses. Then you look up on public record who the owner is. And so then you get these lists of names and then you send it to your skip tracing service for them to provide you phone numbers, right? Correct. Yep. And then you start calling them up. Do you use a uh, automated dialer or do you dial them one at the time? We sure do. <laughs> we actually use Mojo dialer. Mojo. Um, it's yeah, yeah, it's a triple line dialer. You can, it's just way more efficient. So I highly recommend that. And it, uh, for the price, I think, I think it's like 150 to $170 per user and set, setting up your team with that is just a great way to, to not make them hate themselves for <laughs> having to hand dial everything, you know? In other words, um, it sounds like you went down that road uh, when you started <laughs> out without using an automated dialer, right? 100%. Cause you can only, you can only hit maybe a hundred dials, you know, a day manually or you're just like, Oh my gosh, man, I, got, I have other things to do, you know? So, um, so how's the automated data work? I mean, you upload the phone numbers into the software and then you sit down and, and what happens? It, it is extremely good. I'm, I don't, I'm not an affiliate for Mojo or whatever. This is just for personal experience. It has been absolutely phenomenal and it's totally blown the brakes off of our business. Once we actually started applying it, I had been doing manual calls for a long time and it was just, it is just terrible, but you pay your dues, you know, and you do learn and, and you kind of get in the trenches that way. But I highly recommend Mojo just because whenever you upload, so that after that list is done, uh, get in skip trace, you get it back in an Excel spreadsheet. You can auto populate it into Mojo and Mojo will pretty much take it from there. It, it, they'll say, all right, which columns do you want us to keep? Right. And then you say, okay, these ones, and then it'll just automatically upload it with all of the numbers. Um, and you just click on that and you can just hit go and you're ready to go. How many people can you realistically talk to in a day or in an hour? In an hour. So it just kind of depends on the length of the conversation on, especially on inheritance lists. A lot of them are either the ones that want to do business with you anyways, are a little older. So they like to talk a little bit more. So just be prepared for that. It just kind of depends on the list. If it's like an, a basic list, like an absentee owner list, the owner doesn't necessarily live at the property, then it's, it might be quick. It might be a quicker yes, no, but, it, but I would say we are, we're usually getting about 5% of the people on the, uh, out of all of the dials per hour. So for every like hundred dials, we're getting anywhere from like five to 10 people on the phone. And then from that, 
usually about one lead per hour, one lead sheet an hour. Gotcha. How many lead sheets have you got to get on average before you do a deal? About six. So. Wow. That's amazing, Josiah. So out of six property lead sheets, you're doing a deal. So it, yeah, somewhere it varies anywhere from six to 10. Wow. It that's amazing. Yeah. In my world, if, if you're getting uh, one out of 15, you're doing uh, really good. But you know, we got another mastermind uh, member, Crystal and Dan, mm -hmm. that uh, have just been amazing. I, I think she's been running like around about eight, eight or so. She's, she's a beast. I swear. She's awesome. I mean, <laughs> she, she was like, yeah, what is that a conversion rate? Oh, everybody calls me, turns it into a deal. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. So you're doing the dialing, the out, outbound dialing. And so, hey, let's drill down on that outbound dialing thing for a second before we move sure. further. So when somebody's on the phone, I would anticipate you don't have much time to establish rapport before they just hang up on you. Uh, actually, not at all. I, and I think that is one of the biggest misconceptions that are out there when people are thinking about cold calling. And they're, oh, my God, everyone's just going to hang up. You know, everyone's just going to hang up. And, it, and like, I, like I said, it's all about the way that you frame yourself. Framing is in your voice, too. So when you are getting on the phone with somebody, I, I don't remember the last time I've been cussed out. You know, in the beginning, yeah, because I didn't know how to frame myself, but I've, I haven't been cussed out in, I mean, maybe probably like six months. What does your um, outline or scripting sound like when, you, when someone says, you know, hello? What do you say? Oh, hello. I, I mean, it's, it's, oh, hey, John Seller. You know, oh, hey, John. Always the first name. Oh, hey, John. Hi, my name is Josiah. Uh, sorry for this call out of the blue like this, but I, I was just wondering uh, about a house that I think you own over on XYZ Main Street. Yeah, is it? Oh, yeah, I think I might own that. Okay. Well, we were actually in the neighborhood and uh, we were actually looking to buy a home in the neighborhood and we're wondering if you had thought about selling yours or would even consider an offer on it. And then yes, no, maybe so, whatever. And then you kind of take the conversation from there. So what do you do different today than, than you did when you started out? I mean, what did you do when starting out that, you know, sometimes people would like cuss you out and hang up and now they don't. What do you do different? <laughs> Using a script helps, definitely good script helps, but understanding rebuttals and empathizing with people's moods and, and understanding uh, their time frame. Don't waste people's time is a good way to put that. And also being very polite, nice, and having a, an overall attitude of a friendly neighbor, not a large corporation real estate investor that's calling you, you know, like a a credit card company giving you a call or a, uh, or, or, you know, a car salesman or, or somebody who's going to be more harsh. It's, it's, Oh, hey, Oh yeah. Well, you know, we were actually wondering uh, about that house. We just didn't know if you, you were interested in selling it or not. Oh, okay. Well, you know, Oh no, I was not really interested, but thanks for the call. I actually get thanks for calls. So that's, that's pretty good. But as, they're usually the older ladies, but they're, Oh, thank you for the call. <laughs> so what do you say to them when they say, well, how did you get my phone number? Usually that it depends on the list. We're not going to lie to them. If it was a driving for dollars list, we'll say, Hey, we're at, we actually drove by and we wanted to reach out and you'd be surprised how far Google goes. <laughs> either, either that, if I actually Googled, if I actually Googled their number, if it was just like a one off or something like that, or if it is a big bulk list, we'll say, we actually have a third party company that we send addresses to if we're interested in buying and they send us numbers if we have them. And here we are. Yeah, perfect. You can't beat just being a straight shooter and, and telling the truth. Well, yep. Josiah, I know that uh, you've done quite a few deals, you know, over the past few months, but I'm, I'm interested in you uh, sharing your story with uh, one of the deals. You can pick any deal that you want to and share the story about the deal. And let's share with the audience some very important lessons learned that you learned while doing the deal. Okay. Do you, do you want to start with story first or, or how I got into it or what? I'm going to turn it over to you. You, you tell it the way you think the audience will learn the most. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Well, so I'll, I guess I'll just keep it short and, and, and skip the, the background story of how I got into real estate and everything like that. Cause it's long just for time's sake. But essentially when I first got started, I was on the phone a lot and I had pretty much was going to burn my ships and die on my sword. So I, I quit my job to go into this full time 
I, after I had kind of started learning about this stuff and I had been studying, my eyeballs and my, my ears were bleeding from how much I was studying every single day and listening to tapes and watching YouTube videos and just being ob totally obsessed. Uh, All right, Josiah. So, Josiah, let me interrupt you right there. So, man. you said you quit your job. Mm -hmm. So, let me start right there. <laughs> knowing what you know now versus <laughs> yeah. not knowing what you didn't know then when you quit your job. What's your advice on when somebody should quit their day job and go full time into real estate investing based on your experience? After you've closed a couple of deals. Because <laughs> <laughs> you quit your day job and jumped in and had no deals, right? Yeah, I quit my day job, jumped in and had no deals for, for 30 days. Well, I was doing a lot of everything. So I, I had a life savings of like five grand uh, saved up from just overtime and and I was like, man, I'm going to do this or, you know, die. So, <laughs> so I just went ahead and did it. And I, I put my two weeks in at the job I was working at part-time just because being a realtor, you're broke. So, <laughs> well, hey, look, you were, you, were working, you were working for tips anyway, right? Yeah, I was working for tips. Yeah, yeah. So I went ahead and, and took that life savings and, uh, and, and applied it to marketing budget first month. I almost, man, I almost spent my entire five grand that first month trying to figure out something that works and getting lazy with it, you know, like outbound stuff like mail when I didn't know how to mail, you know, or who to mail and, and just blasting out at everything. So took the shotgun approach and that is never a good idea. Don't just blast out something, pick something, study it, do your research and then apply the marketing money because that marketing money does not come back if you waste it. So or, or do it in the wrong way. So, and it ended up coming back to just the most basic thing is just getting on the phone and talking to people. So that ended up, you know, me getting that first deal. So. All right. Um, well, I, I didn't mean to do, I didn't mean to derail you there on your story, sorry, but I didn't want people to hear your advice on when they should quit their day job before jumping in to, you know, full-time real estate investing. So back, so back to the story on, on this deal. Okay. 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 Sorry about that. But just to, before we get to, just to answer that, wait until you're, you're steady and you've done a couple of deals, then quit and then yeah, transition. But anyway, so first deal, I was doing a lot of cold calling and I was pretty much down to the wire. I get someone on the phone and we, it, this seller was out of, uh, it, it was from an absentee owner list that I'd bought and uh, I had skipped trace. I went ahead and gave him a call and he was interested in selling. Apparently he had, well, what he had said was that some other real estate investors had come out, went out and given an offer and the offer wasn't really that great or whatever. It had offered like 135 and the property was worth well, I, what I thought it was worth at the time. It was in a bit of a rural area and there weren't any real comps. Lesson number one, as I go into that, um, make sure that there are comps in an area if you're going to wholesale a property because uh, that's so key when buyers are looking at in that area and how to sell those, make sure that there's a lot of comps and you can justify your after repaired value. Anyways. So I, I gave him a call, got him on the phone. We ended up just building a ton of rapport. This guy just listened to him. He was an elderly gentleman, uh, disabled, uh, I think a bit of an alcoholic, but he, it, sometimes if you call him during like later during the night, he wasn't exactly all there. So I, I kept the conversations before 5 PM, <laughs> but I got him on the phone and, and we were just relating and building a ton of rapport. And then over the phone, and I'm at this point, I'm so desperate for a deal because I'm in, in chaos management, right? Which is a terrible place to be when you are like down to the wire. You don't have any money. You needed a deal to close yesterday and it's just not good. So I ended up making him an offer. I said, well, well, listen, you know, I, I know you got an offer, but if you're not going to compete, then I'll just, uh, he's like, I'll give you 140 right now. You know, if we can sign a contract over the phone. So I actually got him under contract over the phone before I even saw the property another mistake <laughs> if, I, if you don't know what the comps are in the area or aren't 100 percent positive in the area and i went ahead and did that we got it signed that day and i went out to see the property and, and, and got the keys mailed to me and uh went out and, and looked in and set it up actually which was this was just me being an idiot i actually didn't have a lockbox at the time so i only had i was like man this is like 30 minutes away from me I had a car key fob, like a key fob in the, <laughs> like the one you put under your tire, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
like the one you put on your tire had a key in it and I, I put it to the back of the HVAC, right? That's how I, that's how I sold that first property, which is don't do that. <laughs> Cause I almost lost the key. So <laughs> don't do that. And once I, once I started getting buyers in there and, and, and realizing that my numbers were way off, it needed like 25 grand worth of rehab, which is not bad. But I put it out there at, at, at too high of a price. Also, I, I put it out there at like I had it under contract for 140. I put it out there at like 155. I saw everybody online, all these online places. Everybody's cashing these huge checks, you know, in the, in all the Facebook groups and things like that. The motivational like check bragging or whatever it is. Right. So you got this property under contract for 140, and now you are attempting to wholesale it to another real estate investor to. Yes to actually take it down and cash out and give you uh, either do a simultaneous close where you get the difference between your contract price and what you're going to sell it for or get an assignment fee. Right? So right. how did you start marketing it to real estate investors? How did you get that list pulled together of people to market that property to? And that leads me to my next uh, mistake, which was not having enough buyers. So uh, you should be building your buyers list while you are looking for deals. <laughs> I was just looking for deals. I was not really looking for buyers that much. I only had like maybe two or three just from basic networking stuff. I knew that there was a couple. I really only had two or three and not that many. So biggest takeaway from that one, make sure you're building your buyers list. Always, always building your buyers list. But I went ahead and got, I got them on the phone and everything and no one was interested. So I was like, oh gosh, what's, what's wrong? You know, what are, what's wrong with my numbers? It only is 25 and, uh, you know, at work, I got a 55 and things like that. It, maybe this would be a good buy and hold for somebody, but no, it, it, it wasn't. <laughs> so I actually ended up putting an ad on Craigslist for it. I also don't recommend doing that if you don't know how to do it the right way because they're you don't want to be marketing a, another person's property right so but i i did and i got a bunch of calls i actually had a realtor call me and the realtor was like hey man i i saw that you had that that property over there and i actually have a buyer's list down there i'm in tallahassee and i used to be from gainesville and, and i used to actually start i started wholesaling as well but i went into uh into the retail side and i do a little bit of both out of tallahassee so i was like Oh, what? wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have any buyers. Like, yes, great. Blast them out. And you know, I'm coming up on my inspection period. This is like day 12 of my 15 day inspection, something like that. It was very down to the wire. And I had a $500 earnest money, which is too much uh, for a wholesale FISBO. And I, I was like, Oh my freaking out that I'm going to lose this 500 bucks. Right. And, uh, cause I really needed it at the time. And I am calling him. He blasted out. He gets a buyer for me. And we ended up, closing that deal seven days later after I had to get a reduction for like 38 grand from, from the seller to make that deal close. Cause when the buyer came in at like one Oh five, I think it was, yeah, like one Oh five. And I was like, Oh my gosh, what, you know, what, after I got the feedback and realized what the property was really worth, it was really worth like 180. but I, I, you know, that's the thing prepare, do your due diligence. Don't just put lousy contracts together. Uh, cause I, I got a little lucky there. So what did you do, Josiah? Did you go back to the seller and renegotiate the contract and you say, Hey, there's no way I'm going to find a buyer anywhere around this price. So I went back to the seller and kind of explained that, that one, I had, uh, I had oh, underestimated the amount of repairs that it was, that was needed. And went around and kind of just justified my offer a little bit once I was educated on it and was like, listen, man, this is just, isn't going to work out. I have to go a little bit lower. You know, where can we meet on this? And he was, he, he was very, very insistent at first, but we finally made it happen because he, he really needed a, he did need the money. That was his intangible. It wasn't, it wasn't the price that was his issue. It, it was the fact that he needed it to be done. He was disabled. He couldn't do the work. All of his family was, was out of state and, and couldn't, handle anything. So he was able to take a reduction to 102 and I, I was able to sell it for 105. The realtor was, he was like, man, this is, this is your first one. This has been a rough time. He's like, oh, and it's, it's, you know, it's a $3,000 spread. I'll just take a thousand bucks and we'll do more deals in the future. That's fine. So I ended up getting the, the bulk of that, that, that first one. I got uh, 66% of that. So two grand was, was the first actual profit. And then plus my, my escrow deposit back. I got you. So any other lessons learned on that first deal? 
Yes, do your due diligence and anchor low. So do your due diligence before you make offers. Make educated offers so that you're not wasting people's time and that you don't look bad, right? Because that, that was one of the things. Like your reputation is so huge. You don't want to be putting contracts together that you, you genuinely you can't close on, right? So you want to make sure that your numbers are solid and, and that you've got it at a good enough price that you're going to be able to move the property really quickly. Um, That's awesome. That's awesome. And, and serve the seller the best way you can. So. Well, Josiah, we are just about out of time. I want to have you back on the show and, and get another case study story from you. But um, any closing remarks or advice uh, you want to give out there? Yeah, to, to millennials. So all the you young people, right, like that are my age, when you're thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, it can be a very lonely road, right? Don't listen to all those naysayers and people that say that you can't do it and things like that, or that you need to get a degree, or you need this, or you need this, and this, just don't listen to that stuff. You know what's best for you and your, and, it, and it's your responsibility to make the most money that you possibly can and set yourself up because you don't have time. People like to tell you that you have time. You know, you don't have time. It goes by quick. Life is short uh, and you need to plan and, and, be, and, uh, and learn as much as you can and add as much value and make as much money as you can as quickly as possible. So that's my biggest advice. That's awesome. <laughs> Josiah Rivera, thank you so much, man, for joining me here on the show. Thank you so much, man. I, I really appreciate it. I hope we can talk soon and do this again sometime. That sounds great. All right, folks. Thanks for joining in. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. And here's to taking your real estate investing business to the next level. From now until then, we'll see you on the next show. Bye for now.